I remember a story where Sam Altman wrote a program to analyze how great founders, those that run billion dollar companies, reply compared to bad founders. The average response time for bad founders was days, but the average response time for great founders was minutes. Welcome to the Lubo Smith Podcast. I'm your host, Lubo, co-founder and CEO of STRV. Here to talk to the industry leaders from the tech and startup space and ask them about their tips and tricks they use to operate at the top of the game. Today, I'm happy to welcome Rahul Wara, the founder and CEO of Superhuman, my favorite email client that I could not live without. Rahul is a serial startup founder who previously built and exited his startup reportive to LinkedIn. Since then, he has invested in many other companies, but today he is building Superhuman. It's an email client that impacts my daily productivity. And when the opportunity to have Rahul on the podcast presented itself, I was very intrigued because I see it as one of the stickiest products out there and getting an inside scoop what it's like to be building such a product was very intriguing to me. So let's dive into the discussion. And we are Rowan. Welcome, Rahul. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for hopping on the show. I know that your career has a little evolved around email productivity. And I wanted to ask you right away why productivity is uh, something that you feel passionate about and it's part of your interest. Uh, because I'm a founder and especially for founders, it really does matter. I think that's true basically for uh, anyone who works in technology. I remember a story where Sam Altman wrote a program to analyze how great founders, those that run billion dollar companies, reply compared to bad founders, those who struggle and ultimately eventually fail. And as you would expect, the average response time for bad founders was days, but the average response time for great founders was minutes. Uh, Now, you might think, well, that's simply about impressing an investor, but As you know, you also run a company. When you are a startup, the need for speed goes much deeper than that. Because as founders, we kind of set the bar for everything that happens in our companies. Almost nothing will happen faster than we do it. And so if we've ever felt, well, I wish folks would do more or I wish folks would move faster, it's we that have to move faster. And that's true everywhere, whether it's Twitter, Slack, or email. No, I, I, I totally see that. And I think that there is some correlation, of course, like faster responses are not guarantee of success, right? But they increase the odds, I would say. They increase the odds in ways that are obvious. You know, if you reply back to a customer or a candidate faster, you are more likely to close the customer or hire the candidate but they also impact things in ways that are less obvious. When you go faster, everything around you goes faster. And that creates this sort of compounding effect that some companies like, of course, OpenAI, uh, but also other companies like Stripe have taken to a great extreme. They do everything super fast. When we look into your journey from building Reportive, then uh, taking it through an acquisition and then moving towards superhuman, uh, there is still like that uh, common element of being extremely productive, right? Reportive was uh, serving uh, very relevant information in no time. Um, how are these uh, ideas evolving uh, in your head and how do you pick up uh, what's uh, what's the right thing to focus on, or how did you pick up uh, the the two uh, areas being reportive and superhuman? What was the process around that? Well, the process for reportive was based on my experience at the time. At the time, I was running Cambridge University Entrepreneurs, which is the part of the University of Cambridge that helps staff and students create companies. Essentially, I would go to venture capital firms, to technology consultancies like yours, to uh, business angels, and basically say, hey, can we have some money? We're going to give it to startups. 
Now, you might think, well, that's a relatively easy job. Some startups make a lot of money, but we weren't investing this money. This was grant money. And so, yes, I found myself in the business of not-for-profit fundraising. And this is at the tender young age of about 20, 21. I'd never had a real job before, and no one was teaching me how to do this. So I was figuring it out for myself as I went. And I'm not particularly great with people. So I imagined how software could help me do that better. And that's where I got the idea for Reportive. So for those that don't know, we built the first Gmail plugin to scale to millions of users. When people emailed you, we showed you what they look like, where they worked, their recent tweets, links to their social profiles. We grew rapidly and two years later, we were acquired by LinkedIn. Now, during those four years, I developed a very intimate view of email. I could see Gmail, for example, getting worse every single year, becoming more cluttered, using more memory, uh, consuming more CPU, slowing down your machine, still not working properly offline. And on top of this, people were installing plugins like ours, Reportive, but also Boomerang, Mixmax, Clearbit, you name it, they had it. And each plugin took those problems of clutter, memory, CPU performance offline, etc., made all of them dramatically worse. So we decided it's time for change. We imagined an email experience that is blazingly fast, where search is instantaneous, where every interaction takes place in 100 milliseconds or less, an email experience where you never had to touch the mouse, where you could do everything from the keyboard, you could fly through your inbox, and an email experience that just worked offline so you could be productive anywhere. And finally, an email experience that had the best Gmail plugins, but built in natively. And so it was still somehow subtle, minimal, and visually gorgeous. So with that relatively tall order, we built Superhuman. And that was the through line from being a student at the University of Cambridge through starting Reportive to selling it to LinkedIn, and then ultimately coming up with the vision for building the fastest email experience in the world. Well, before we dive into the features of Superhuman and how it all came along and uh, what are some of the uh, tips and tricks that uh, people can do there, how do you think that the entire space when it comes to work productivity is evolving? And are there any other tools that uh, you like that are shaping up in the space? Well, I think if we look at companies like Notion, Figma, Loom, Linear, all of which I rely on day to day and I love, there's been a real renaissance in the quality of productivity software, the charm, the charisma, so to speak, which I think we helped create. We helped start that. Uh, For example, Superhuman was the first app to really popularize Command K, this idea of a command palette that we now take for granted in these other experiences. We were the first application to really say, as weird as this was, speed is our number one feature. Everything that you do is going to be instantaneously fast. And not every other app has taken that on, but I think more apps care about it now because we do. So as a software creator, I find that tremendously exciting and I hope that this trend continues. Yeah, especially with Command K, uh, you are hundred percent right that I use it everywhere now, and I'm obsessed because, right. like, uh, yeah, we 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 ditch the mouse and we just like are super fast on the keyboard. So I feel like you know I'm uh, heavily influenced by, of course, using using your product. But what I wanted to ask you about is the point of view on the way how we communicate, right? Uh, email is we could call it a legacy technology. But uh, for me, it's the most robust way how to communicate and organize today. And I know that there has been a lot of other attempts how to disrupt that. But for some reason, it seems like it's still holding up really strong. And I wanted to ask you if you have a particular opinion Why is that so and why we are still so reliant on email? So we need tools like Superhuman that take this legacy technology and wrap it up in an interface that is super seamless and fast to use. 
Great question. So I think we can break this down into the durability of what I would call the naming scheme of email. And then we can talk about the actual structure of email itself that gives it great longevity. So the durability of the naming scheme, in other words, email addresses. If you think about my email address, rahul at superhuman.com, by the way, feel free to email me. It's the simplest form of addressing me at a specific company in a way that is owned by the company that you can come up with. So you could argue, well, what about phone numbers? Aren't they in even more compressed form, a handful of digits? And yes, they're shorter than many email addresses, but they're not owned by companies. So in order for business communication to happen, you need a very clear and a very compressed way of identifying any one person at any one company that's human readable, that's human memorable, and is owned by the organizations themselves. And that's actually what an email address is. So what are the chances that email clients or the email experience looks the same 10 years from now compared to today? Zero, absolutely nil. The experience is going to change dramatically. But you know what will stay the same? Email addresses, because they are incredibly durable. So that's why email addresses aren't going out of fashion anytime soon and why we rely on them. The second thing is the actual structure of email. We can turn this into a a similar question. I felt like we were maybe dancing around the bush a little bit. Why hasn't Slack or Microsoft Teams killed email? In fact, why do we, in many organizations, go back to email as, as you said it, the only really robust way to manage communication at scale? Well, there are a few good reasons for that, but it boils down to the information hierarchy and structure. Email is by far the best way to manage a very high volume of asynchronous conversations that require deep thought, many of which may be with people who are external to your company. So I know you use Superhuman, you probably use the heck out of the Remind Me feature, that gives you the ability to stay on top of dozens, if not hundreds of conversations simultaneously. These can be external, these can be internal, and they can be very long-lived conversations. Now imagine trying to do that inside of Slack. In fact, imagine a typical day with Slack. You wake up in the morning, if like me, you're in hundreds of channels, and it's difficult to know which 50 or 60 actually matter at any given time. All of them have unread, bold text signifying that I need to go there. It's very unclear where I actually need to go. And the things that I care about, the dozen or so asks that I put out over the last two or three days, basically impossible to find. There's no single list that I can work through to say, okay, follow up on this, follow up on that, do this, do that, do this. But that's exactly what email and that's exactly what superhuman gives you. Every morning, you can be like, okay, here's my list, bang, 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 all the way through it, got to inbox zero, and the stuff I haven't got to, I'll snooze to tomorrow. So it is a remarkably durable information hierarchy. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. And uh, I find it interesting that, you know, when I look at it from the protocol standpoint that, uh, you know, it's just like people don't really care what's happening on the background. People only care about what's their experience for them, right? So you can take something that is relatively old, but if you package it up nicely, then you get an experience that uh, works uh, extremely fast and brings a lot of value, as you said. Um, Exactly. So The, The issue was never the structure of email. In fact, the structure of email is extremely powerful. It was the user interface, it was Gmail, it was Outlook that was making it really, really hard and unpleasant to be in. Can we look into what you see as the most popular features of Superhuman? You you mentioned reminders. Yes, I very heavily uh, rely on them. That's probably uh, one of the the core features that I use every day, snoozing uh, uh, emails for later. Of course, like not everything that you receive uh, needs your attention right away. 
Uh, but uh, what are some of your uh, most popular features uh, uh, in, in your opinion? Well, let's start with reminders, seeing as we're there, and then I'll touch on three others. So with reminders, imagine you're sending a crucial email, you're closing a deal, you're meeting a deadline, you're trying to land a critical meeting, but people are busy. You may not hear back. So how do you track this? Well, maybe you keep everything in your head or maybe you painstakingly copy it all to your to-do list. Both of those are kind of crazy. They're just not going to work at scale. So instead in Superhuman, what people do is they set follow-up reminders. After you send an email, just set a reminder to bring it back if there is no reply, for example, in two days. And from the perspective of someone who's managing a team, this is what lets me manage many hundreds of simultaneous conversations at once, all of which have different kinds of cadences. Some I need to get back to in two days, some it's okay for me to just let slide until the next quarter. So those are follow-up reminders. Next, I'll mention Get Me to Zero. This is a relatively new feature that we built over the course of the last year that you can experience when you sign up for Superhuman. If you've been a long-time user and you haven't seen this, just hit Command K, Get Me to Zero, and you can give it a go. Now, the, the genesis from this came from some of the more extreme inboxes that we've seen. Inboxes with hundreds, thousands, even millions of emails. And this is psychologically daunting. I would go so far as to say it's very unhealthy. Will you really reply to emails that are older than a month or even a week? Now, I know we all intend to, so we keep them in our inbox out of a misguided sense of guilt but we will probably never catch up. And guess what? The most productive people in the world, well, they don't even try. So what we recommend is deciding on your own personal use-by date for email and then archive everything that's older than that date. You'll then be within a stone's throw of Inbox Zero. And this is remarkably effective, by the way. We're now at the point where 47% of our new customers hit inbox zero within, I think it's about one or two hours of signing up. Within that first few hours, they're hitting inbox zero. Uh, so it's not magic. It really does work. Two more for you. Number All three, right. keyboard shortcuts. Uh, now, I know that you use these extensively, so I don't really have to explain these to you, but the idea is you don't have to touch the mouse. In fact, we've designed it so that the mouse in certain cases is, uh, we're encouraging you, I should say rather, to use the keyboard. Let's say you work an eight hour day, then simply by switching to keyboard shortcuts, you'll save around 134 hours a year. That's 17 work days every single year. Uh, so that's one of the features that we became famous for. We've made it very easy to learn these keyboard shortcuts. We talked a little bit about Command K earlier today. A lot of, you know, some of the concerns I hear from users will be like, well, I don't know keyboard shortcuts or they're hard to remember or I've never really used them in any other application. Well, that's why we built Command K. If you don't know a keyboard shortcut, just hit Command K, type in the thing you were looking for, and not only can you do it immediately from there, it will show you the keyboard shortcut for next time. So it's a way to very gently learn the shortcuts over a period of time. And then finally, I'll mention Split Inbox. This is one of our most powerful features. And we built this because email volume is not your only challenge. You also need to manage email variety. So think about a typical work inbox. Urgent emails will hide behind Google Docs. FYIs will obscure time-sensitive opportunities and things like calendar invites push critical messages below the fold. Now, if you reply, in the order that emails appear, your brain will constantly be switching gears. You'll switch between projects. You'll alternate between brief acknowledgements and in-depth replies. You'll flip from updating your team to replying to your family. Now, this is context switching, and it costs valuable time. In fact, studies have shown that whenever we switch contexts, it takes our brain about 20 minutes to recover and to get back into full efficacy. So to solve this, 
what you really need to do is use an email client that lets you split your inbox into coherent streams that you can process independently. And Superhuman is the one that does that the best. Well, to that, I have a question in terms of how many split boxes you personally use and rely on. So we get some well, inside let's scoop. Let's see. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go take a look. Uh, right now, I have, and I, I do change these over time. Some of them are ephemeral. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So you are quite a have, power user of uh, split inboxes. I only have three. Uh, and I find them so I find I, them very useful. I would absolutely recommend fewer rather than more. I'm constantly pushing our features to their limits just to see how they fare. In case folks are curious, I have escalations. These are customer issues that I'm tracking personally and want to stay on top of continuously. Uh, internal conversations with my executive team and with the wider team, then Google Docs, Notion, Figma, and a general stream for customer support. And the reason why I pull out Google Docs, Notion, and Figma is if I am being addressed, if I am being mentioned in any one of those tools, it's usually super important and uh, things tend to block on me if I were not to get back quickly. So I want to get back to a comment in any three of those tools basically instantaneously. Got it. Yeah, that uh, I think is a great tip how you can fully leverage the tool. Um, one of the features that you haven't mentioned that I find particularly useful is that if you are trying to reach a person, there is some very specific uh, window when you should be sending that email. So you increase the odds that you get a response, right? Because yes. not not everyone has uh, uh, an inbox organized that well that it will be split into different categories, right? And there is still people that go top to bottom. So mm -hmm. if you send an email, uh, usually early in the day uh, when people tend to get it and your email ends up uh, being on the very top, then the odds that you will receive a response are a lot higher and what i find useful is that you can very quickly type in i want to send this email in morning uh in new york and then you you just uh hit uh, send later and it does everything for you and like you can go into like specifying the locations like you have you have tweaked it very nicely that it's super intuitive and like I have never really found a way that it would not pick up the city or or anything. It's it just works like a magic. Amazing. Well, well, thank you for saying so. It was quite fun coming up with the list of all of the cities and locations we thought people would put in there. Uh, so if you find one that we don't don't support, please let me know. Uh, yeah, this was designed for people who collaborate, who sell, who generally do work across time zones. And a good example is if I'm in uh, California, where I am right now, and I'm working with someone who might be, uh, let's say, in Tokyo in Japan, that time zone difference is brutal. It's really hard to send an email at the right time. And the last thing you want to do is send an email in the middle of somebody else's night, because by the time they wake up, your email is now buried past maybe dozens or hundreds of other emails, and you're massively reducing the chances that they get to you. And so actually what you want to do is you want to send the email usually in the first few hours of somebody else's working day. And Superhuman makes that very easy. Well, we are now in experiencing a huge uh, rise of AI and all the AI-assisted tools. Uh, you have recently implemented uh, Superhuman AI as well, where you can basically uh, mention, prompt, whatever you want to respond with, and it does the, the rest uh, for you. Um, what are all the things that you leverage uh, in terms of crafting the best response automatically? Does it get like the, the context of the entire conversation? What are some of the best use cases of the superhuman AI? Yeah, great question. Okay, 
So what are the use cases? Well, with Superhuman AI, which we launched earlier this year, uh, around the June-July timeframe, you can now write entire messages effortlessly. And not only that, you can do it in your own voice and tone. So with this, you can reply instantly. Imagine you get uh, an email from someone amazing like yourself and you're like, hey, I think your stuff is cool. I want you to be on my podcast. Uh, well, what you can do with Superhuman AI is you can hit command J, that's our shortcut for Superhuman AI, and just in note form, explain what you want to say. So I could hit command J and say, uh, thanks, yes, a little bit busy in Q3, let's do this in Q4, hit enter. And instead of just sending you that, which in most working environments would be considered kind of a rude thing to say, it actually will pull the whole thing into a really nice email that is written in my own voice and tone. So that's one use case, which is instant reply or turning an idea into an email. Uh, but we have other things. You can summarize along threads. You can translate languages. You can polish your writing. Uh, so for example, you can fix spelling and grammar. You can improve the clarity of what you're saying. You can change the length of your emails all with just a few keystrokes. We like to say it's having a professional editor just for you and you can polish your emails with speed and with confidence. So in terms of what do we leverage, what is the context? Uh, yes, absolutely, it's the email you're responding to, but it's also the context of the entire thread. It's also conversations you've had with those other recipients, and it's also other emails you've written in general in order for us to be able to match your voice and your tone. So it's basically your training model that is particularly uh, focused on one uh, on one sender. Uh, is that uh, how I could imagine it? Or um, like the, the more yeah, I, with, with the more I use it, the the better uh, responses I will have. Exactly. Without getting too far into the technical details, we are customizing the responses around the way that you write and around the way that you talk with specific people. Got it. And um, I know that uh, the feature is available on, on the desktop right now. Is it uh, coming to mobile as well? Because I uh, feel that it's not uh, available there yet. Absolutely. In fact, I have it on my phone right now. I was uh, spending a great deal of time today playing with it. It is uh, not, not only very useful, it is a tremendous amount of fun as well. And I'm very excited for it to come out on iOS, which is where it will be coming, because it's even harder to type on a mobile device than it is on a desktop. So we think the productivity gains and having access to something like Superhuman AI on the go will be even greater. I would say that, like, um, you know, the, when you look at the amount of time that people spend on their mobile phones uh, versus uh, the amount of time that people spend on desktop, that's where I think just being able to respond quickly, maybe use uh, voice to text uh, to uh, and dictation to get uh, the response uh, to someone even faster, I think could uh, be remarkably helpful. Absolutely. In fact, that's how I drive superhuman AI on my iPhone. Uh, so when I'm in a conversation, I tap the AI button, I then tap the microphone and I just dictate my fairly rough notes of a response, and then I hit go, and it turns those rough notes, which I gave with voice, into a perfectly written email in the way I would write it. Yeah, that's uh, uh, my, my go-to as well, to rely on dictation as much as possible, because I can just spread uh, random thoughts and that it organizes it nicely. What I wanted to ask you also about is, uh, how do you look at the product stickiness because i feel like with both of the products that you have built reportive and superhuman they are extremely sticky when it comes to like you use it once and then you want to be using it all the time and i remember many many years ago that you know i got uh, um i got used to using reportive and then for some time it was not working and I was like, oh, how do I do it now? 
it was so easy to find a contact for someone and then yeah. it was gone for uh, for a little bit and with superhuman as well it's like uh when i use the product i am like i i actually enjoy uh <laughs> doing my emails uh, versus uh you know if i would have to be doing it otherwise so i just wanted to ask you about the uh, the stickiness and the product market fit uh how did you work uh, how do you approach those uh those things two products that are very sticky in very different ways reportive was a browser extension so all we had to do was get you amped and excited enough to install it and then it would start delivering value in that those first few days those first few weeks and when you experience that value that's when as you say you come to rely on it but you don't really have to remember to use it it's always there superhuman on the other hand we are almost playing product market fit on hard mode because we have to rely on you wanting to come back into superhuman every single day and the only way to actually achieve that is to have a product that delivers exceptional results we did an analysis of 10000 users recently comparing their 30 days before superhuman to their 30 days after superhuman and we were able to show some crazy market differences for example they're replying to two to three times as many emails in a given period of time so two to three times as many emails let's say in an hour and perhaps even more importantly they're replying to those emails 8 to 13 hours sooner that's a whole business day faster which as you can imagine is life changing it's business changing you're going to win deals and get things done that you just would never otherwise have gotten done and then finally they're saving 4 hours or more every single week now when your product has metrics like that that's when it gets really sticky and the precise numbers depend on what your product is and what it's designed to do but that's why superhuman is a sticky product well we talked a lot about the positives uh, of uh, the product that you have built uh, and just to put it in a perspective where do you think right now you have the biggest gaps uh, uh what is uh, uh keeping you awake at night is anything i hope you sleep soundly but uh <laughs> hypothetically what could be some of the areas where you would like to be a lot stronger well i suffer from sleep apnea so if i'm awake at night it's because of that uh fortunately otherwise i do sleep soundly the areas where we have room for growth there are many but that there are several that i'm tracking right now first of all are our multiplayer features so historically superhuman was almost entirely a single player product today we have our first few multiplayer features we have shared read statuses so if you email somebody and you cc someone who is on your superhuman team not only can you see when your contact opens your emails but your team members can see as well that has been incredibly popular people love that we also have team typing indicators so you can see when somebody else is replying to an email and that way you don't end up awkwardly colliding with one of your coworkers in this vein we are about to release team snippets soon you may use snippets this is our feature for templates they're very powerful blazingly fast templates and now or i should say in a few weeks you will be able to create and share those snippets across your team so we're really excited about that and we have many more team features to come so that's area number 1 uh, area number 2 is the enterprise we are selling our first several multi thousand seat deals right now these are true enterprise deals with fortune 100 fortune 500 type companies it's tremendously exciting i'm really buzzed and amped about it there are things that we need to build in order to support those deals things like mobile device management data loss prevention and various other things that enterprises need in order to deploy and manage software at scale so we're building those things right now super exciting uh, and i would say the third thing that we are pushing on is continued platform uh support i think is the right word so we launched superhuman for outlook 
last year. We launched Superhuman 4 Windows earlier this year. We launched Superhuman 4 Android a month or two ago. And we're quickly filling in all the pieces of this beautiful puzzle. The last piece that is left is support for Outlook on Android. And with that, which we're working on in Q4, we will have officially built every single piece of platform support. So we will have web, Mac, Windows, iOS, Android for Gmail and Outlook and whatever that complex web of interactions is, we'll have all of it. So those are the areas where we're building. The whole suite. I like that. Exactly. Um, you have really, I think, narrowed down the focus on the people that want to be productive, right? You have uh, showed them how to do it. What is? Uh, what do you think about the competition uh, in in your niche? Of course, like you are not building, uh, in my opinion, a product for everyone, right? You are picking your audience. Uh, is there someone who is uh, going after the same audience, someone who you keep uh, on your radar uh, when it comes to the competition? I mean, the short answer is no, not really. I think it was Paul Graham who said, competition doesn't kill startups. The main thing that kills startups is when they run out of steam and die. And that usually happens either due to running out of money or due to running out of patience. Uh, unfortunately, we have plenty of both. And so we're doing just <laughs> fine on that side. Uh, I, yeah, I don't track any, any competitor in particular. I don't even think we have any uh, true competitors. It's really awareness is what we're up against. And frankly, I wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, it's really just us in the market. And maybe um, last regard before we look more into the future uh, and entrepreneurship overall. Uh, when it comes to the early days and how you marketed the product, uh, to me, it seemed like you were building the rather smaller, tight community of people that would refer themselves and uh, over the years, I have referred many people uh, and talked uh, about superhuman everywhere I could because, like for me, it adds a lot of value, and I wanted to do it uh, uh, for the sake of helping other people to to experience the same. But uh, what is your marketing strategy if you have uh, actually, if if you need it to do any kind of marketing on top of? building a wonderful product and uh, uh, making sure that people spread the word themselves. I think building a good product is the foundation of any good startups marketing strategy. It's possible, but hard to market a bad product. It's much easier when your product is great. And like you, people genuinely want to refer and invite other people to it. Our marketing strategy in the early days had three core pillars. Pillar number one was PR, public relations or press. And I think we've done this pretty well over the years. One of the very first things that we got a PR for was actually when Mailbox shut down. Mailbox shut down, I believe, in 2015 or 16. I may, may have got the year slightly wrong. Um, yeah, I think it was 2016, February 2016. And... I saw the opportunity to inject ourselves into the news cycle. And I think this is possible for any founder, any entrepreneur. There's at least one story a year, if not more, that brings your space back into the zeitgeist for whatever markets that you're in. And by penning an op-ed or by talking to the right journalists, you can insert yourself into the news cycle. And I wrote an article. I think it was called founders, how to stop worrying and love being acquired. Uh, that was based on my experience being acquired by LinkedIn and how that went really, really well. A reporter survived for 10 years post-acquisition. Mailbox survived for hardly any years post-acquisition. And I thought, well, I'd, I'd learned a lot of things about how to survive an acquisition. I'm going to write that article. And it's an evergreen article to this day that is a thing that uh, generates leads and traffic for our website. The second pillar was virality. Uh, as you've mentioned, 
building a product where people genuinely want to refer the product to other people, but also taking advantage of the unique form factor that Superhuman has. It's a communications product. Uh, it's not just people referring other people. It's also our viral signature sent via Superhuman, which I'm sure our listeners have seen before. That still drives more than 50 to 60% of our site traffic. It's still remarkably effective. I think our users have sent north of 2 billion emails at this point. And you can imagine how effective, therefore, that signature is. Very, very powerful. The third piece is brand uh, and or thought leadership. So, for example, our product market fit article. Uh, what we have done is, since the early days, try to create content that is just amazingly useful. And one of the things that I did was I wrote what is still the de facto textbook almost description of how to measure, find, and improve product market fit for a startup. It's the most widely shared entrepreneurship article on first round review. Uh, and it's become the standard for how founders do those things, how they measure and improve product market fit. Uh, it also happens to use Superhuman as a running example throughout the article because I applied it first to Superhuman. And so that's also turned out to be a really good way to get attention onto the company. And uh, do you have some goals outlined where you would like to take it next? What does the future of Superhuman look like in your eyes? So many different things. We are, as I mentioned, working on multiplayer features. And I'm really excited for teams to start using team read statuses, team reply indicators, team snippets, our future upcoming multiplayer features that I can't really talk about, but they're going to be amazing. We are also working on versions of Superhuman for specific job functions. We're building Superhuman for sales. This has a Salesforce integration. It has a HubSpot integration. There is an activity feed of when people are opening your emails. It turns out if you get back to people shortly after or when they're reading your email, well, guess what? They're way more likely to engage with you. And many other things that will make go-to-market teams, whether you are an account executive or an account manager or a customer success manager, way more productive, way more successful. And then the third thing we're building, as I mentioned, is enterprise support. And so for us, going up market is a thing that we feel like we finally, after eight years, finally earned the right to do now that we support Outlook, now that we have an Android client, now that we have a Windows client, now that we have a fully featured email client, now that it is without question the fastest and the most powerful email experience in the world. We finally earned that right. Uh, so I'm excited that we are in many of those conversations right now. We'll, we are closing those deals right now and uh, that it's, it's going to be transformative for our business. Uh, so those are the things that I'm most looking forward to. Got it. Um, I was uh, also thinking about more long-term uh, perspective, whether if you ever end up starting uh, a third company, uh, if it would be also in the productivity space uh, as well. Oh, I see. Uh, well, never say never. <laughs> um, I am a inveterate founder. I constantly found things and think about founding things. I think it's just in my DNA. So another friend asked me earlier today, if there is ever an after superhuman, would I start another company? I think the answer is, you know, it, it'd probably be really hard for me not to. Yeah, I feel like once you get on the journey of entrepreneurship, then you are pretty much stuck with that. And uh, as you are done with one thing, you need to keep yourself busy. <laughs> well, as the joke goes, we are unemployable now. So <laughs> we don't really get a choice. When it comes to entrepreneurship uh, and fundraising, what were some of the biggest lessons learned that you uh, picked up along the way? Because I assume that there were many and uh, you like to share it uh, with with people and uh, produce a lot of articles and such. So what, what uh, were some of the ones that uh, pop up in your head right now? Good question. 
There are so many. And as you know, I'm also an investor. So I've, I've thought about this from both sides. I would say, well, first of all, let's talk about who shouldn't fundraise for a business. You shouldn't fundraise for a business unless you see the possibility of growing into 10 times your valuation. For example, if an investor is offering to invest at a valuation of 10 million, you shouldn't fundraise unless you can see a path to 100. And if they're offering to invest at 100, you shouldn't fundraise unless you can see a path to being worth a billion. As a corollary, it's worth noting that most software businesses can grow to $10 million of annual recurring revenue, and a great founder can position such a business to the right buyer for a $100 million exit. Therefore, you're almost always safe raising money with valuations in the low teens. But as the valuation grows beyond this, you should also know how the business will be valued at more than $100 million. That's a, that's a good wisdom right there. And like you mentioned investing as uh, being something that you are also passionate about. How do you pick, uh, what, what is your secret sauce uh, in selecting uh, some, of your, some of your investments? Uh, what do you look for? So I do my investing with a good friend of mine, Todd Goldberg. And if folks Google Rahul and Todd Angel Fund, you'll find our little website where we house these investments. And we have invested in north of 100 companies at this point. I look for three very specific things. Firstly, I look for founders with the following magic combination. Number one, they know how to make something people want. And number two, this is often forgotten, they know how to make people realize they want it. If a startup only has one of these things, it will unfortunately not be able to succeed. Secondly, I look for founders that demonstrate exceptionally high levels of grit. And I think of grit as the combination of passion and perseverance. Passion means that the founder will not easily get distracted with new interests or goals or go off and found another company. And perseverance means that the founder will follow through with hard things despite challenges. And the founders that have both, uh, that, that are both, I should say, persistent and relentless in moving towards uh, these things are the ones who make their startup successful. And thirdly, I look for the possibility of a billion dollar outcome. And many times we end up passing on great founders with a good business because we weren't able to get to conviction that the business would support a massive billion dollar outcome. What are some of the investments in your portfolio that uh, you are uh, the most passionate about? And I know that you probably uh, don't want to disappoint the others, but uh, if you would like to mention some of the highlights, Sure. Well, I'm passionate about all of them. We wouldn't make the investments unless we really right. cared. Some of those that have been able to break out over the last year or two, uh, companies that are doubling or tripling or, or growing even faster would include companies like Placer.ai, who are building Google Analytics for the real world. If you are Burger King and you're trying to figure out where to open your next franchise or your a hedge fund and you're trying to figure out how to trade on the results of a retail stock before the retail stock has announced their earnings, uh, then you use Placer. And that's just two of their verticals. They sell into many verticals. Uh, they are doing phenomenally well. Uh, so if folks are looking for roles in the tech industry, go check out Placer. They are hiring across the board. Uh, another example would be Class Dojo. Class Dojo is used by, at this point, I think it's in the region of 60 or 70 million children worldwide. It is the application that you use uh, if you are a kid and you want to enhance your learning experience uh, in, in a variety of different ways. And also building a phenomenal social network. We've seen how powerful this can be with companies like Roblox that take a more sort of game-oriented approach or a more social approach to education. And I think we'll be seeing a lot more of this with Class Dojo as well. Uh, so I'd say those are two highlights, uh, two companies that, uh, despite how hard it's been for so many different startups over the last two years, are doing phenomenally well. Well, we are a little bit connected there as well. We have worked with Klaus Dojo for many, many years. Uh, so uh, it's been it's been a great partnership. 
Well, Raul, if there are two to three things that you would like people to take away from this conversation as like the highlights of uh, uh, what uh, they could uh, focus on, because I know that you love uh, sharing knowledge and you are uh, very tuned to that. So just wanted to ask you, what, what do you feel like should be the highlights of uh, what we have covered in the chat? Got it. I would say, number one, if you are a founder, a CEO, or a product owner slash designer in any way, and you haven't yet come across the product market fit engine that we were discussing, definitely check it out. It's very easy to find. Just Google Rahul Vora, Superhuman, product market fit, first round, and it'll be right there, the, the top article. And it is a way which basically guaranteed can take any product to product market fit. It will even write its roadmap for you. I know that sounds crazy, but read it and you will see how. That's the first thing. The second thing is, again, for that audience, the product maker owner audience, if you want to figure out how to make products that feel great, that are even fun to play, if you want to imbue game design into your products, I have another really great resource for you. You can Google Rahul Vora Superhuman Game Design A16Z, as in the Venture Fund, and you can see a talk there I did. I believe it's called Game Design, Not Gamification. And it's about 20 minutes long, and it goes into great detail in how you can apply game design principles into building amazing products. And not everyone knows this, but I used to be a game designer before I was a founder. So I'm able to bring those lessons to bear in a very uh, real fashion. And the third thing I would say is, of course, if you're not yet using Superhuman and you spend any amount of time in email for your job or for a living, uh, then you definitely should because you stand to save hours per week and reply to emails way faster. And as we've heard from Sam Altman earlier, uh, that is immensely valuable and uh, in short can change everything. Uh, so go check us out. We're at superhuman.com. All right. Amazing. Thank you so much, Rahul. Thank you for sharing all the insights and uh, uh, speaking about your journey with uh, Superhuman and all the other things as well. Also, thank you for helping us to get to Inbox Zero. And it was uh, my pleasure hosting you on the show. It was my pleasure being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening or watching to the very end. I hope that can only mean one thing, that you enjoyed it. And if you did, please follow us, subscribe or write a review. It'll be tremendously appreciated by our side. In the meantime, there are a lot of other episodes that you can check out. And I'll be looking forward to catching you next time.